All right, welcome back from break. Uh, CS 4510L09B. Uh, the topic of today's lecture is on Turing completeness. We'll talk about what that means. First, let's formalize exactly. Now that we've given him a simulation evidence in favor of the Church Turing thesis, let me give you the statement of the Church Turing thesis in a way that you are allowed to apply it. There's two things you can do. Um, for any uh, computational model, a decision procedure, automata, you can just say by the uh, church term thesis, it's true that that class is a subset of the recognizable languages. There has to be some kind of sanity checks on when you apply the thesis, like is the computational model real and decent and normal and good? And if it is, seems like a reasonable kind of model of computation, then you can just say that the sub that you get this for free. Okay? If you didn't get this for free, you would, what is the, if you consider not like orthogonal, like if you don't consider anything like this, right? What would be the opposite of this? It would be like somehow this is a strictly more powerful than the Turing machine, but we don't believe such a class to exist by the arguments we've given so far. So certainly every class of real computational models, decision procedures, mechanical processes, all of these are simulatable on a Turing machine. So by the church string thesis, you get to just say that for free now, that we've given evidence in favor. We tried and failed several times to generalize the model computation. Turing machine with the state instruction, Turing machine with a two-way tape, K-tape Turing machine, and a non-deterministic Turing machine. For all, we were able to simulate it. So it appears that we failed to generalize the definition of Turing machine. So you can just say it now for free. Because if there was evidence against it, that would be a big deal and big news. So we just might as well assume it's true. That's what uh, one way to think about the church strength thesis. Another thing the church strength thesis says is that you all don't have to be a programmer. Like, um, if you can imagine how you might write code uh, to compute function, you, uh, then uh, there exists a Turing machine. For it. So if you can just imagine how you might program something, you can reasonably think about an algorithm, then you can just say that there exists a Turing machine for this algorithm. Right? More directly, you would take the idea of your algorithm, convert it your, using Turing's direct appeal to intuition to a Turing machine, and then voila, you have a Turing machine. The reason you would want to do this is because now you can reason about the Turing machine itself. You can say, oh, suppose there exists like DFS or BFS. Okay, input takes a graph, output takes, it reaches the node or whatever, right? You can just say, because you can write an algorithm for it, you can just say there exists a Turing machine to do it. You don't have to actually sit there and write the Turing machine. Um, on the homework, I ask you to, you can't use this on the homework because on the homework I ask you to give several uh, Turing machines and to fine grain uh, down this de the detail of how you can apply this exactly. Um, but these are the two ways you can apply the Turing Turing thesis. If you can imagine a way you might write an algorithm or something, you can just say that there exists a Turing machine and, and reason about that. So that's uh, how you would apply the Turing Turing thesis. Was not on. Um, how would you? Uh, what is Turing complete? So Turing complete is um, a class. Uh, I'll say a model of computation is Turing complete if it is equivalent. to a Turing machine. So 
if you have a model of computation and that's intuitively vague on purpose, it could mean anything. It could mean programming language. It could mean a kind of automata. It could mean a, a Rube Goldberg machine. You know, it could mean anything. Uh, a model of computation is Turing complete if it is equivalent to a Turing machine. How do you prove Turing completeness? We'll say C is uh, Turing complete. If you can prove that you can simulate a Turing machine on your class. So C is a model of computation. C is Turing complete if you can simulate the Turing machine on your class computation. Normally, to prove equivalence of anything, you would need to do a double set containment. Why is it necessary for us to only have to do the containment one way? You have the one above given. Thesis. By the church turing thesis, you get the second containment for free. So by the church turing thesis, you get the reverse containment for free. Perfect. Uh, why? It's true that for any class C, C is simulatable on a Turing machine. So if you can just prove that whatever computational object you are can simulate a Turing machine, congrats. It could only be the case that it was Turing equivalent. It can't be strictly stronger, but by showing it's stronger, certainly then they have to be equal. You have no choice. This is enough to show that they're equal. Um, now let's apply uh, this and let's prove uh, Python is Turing complete. So Python is Turing complete. Uh, by the way, Turing complete means something different in pop culture, and there is a lot of misunderstanding about what this actually means on the internet. And I see this misused all the time. I saw a TikTok, and the guy was like, "Did you know C is not Turing complete?" And he said something about how, like. The size of operator in C allows you, puts a bound on the possible, every pointer has to be, size of, of any pointer has to return something. And then there's a bound on the number of possible pointers. So then there's a finite amount of space that any C, pro, C program can use. Something like this. Um, or address, or allocate. Uh, the Turing machine does not use infinite space in a usable way. We're really only concerned with computation with halt. So it's not really, a finite, a Turing machine with finite tape is strictly not Turing complete, okay? Um, but it doesn't mean it's not like a good model of a computer. Every computer has finite RAM, okay? Finite memory, there's finite amount of things in the universe, you know? If a computation takes more than 80 years to compute, is it, it doesn't mean it's not computable, it just means, you know, you as a mortal observer will die before it finishes. Doesn't mean it's not a real computation or whatever. Similarly, just because our all, everything we interact with in the universe is finite anyway, doesn't mean it's not, you know, the Turing machine does not use the infinite tape in a usable way. I also see sometimes Turing completeness mentioned uh, with respect to computer systems or, or, or something like this, and we'll talk about this uh, somewhat towards the end. Uh, Python is Turing complete. I want to prove that the Python programming language is Turing complete. Here, uh, the proof is going to be a little bit illustrative in, in that saying something is Turing complete may not be illustrative that it's a good language. Okay, how would we prove Python is Turing complete? And again, just to be clear here, by Python, I mean the ideal programming language Python. You have an ideal programming language and it does something, it's just, it's just quite literally syntax and definitions. It just happens to run on a real, com a real computer, but consider the limitations of the programming language syntax and the definitions. I claim Python is Turing complete. Uh, you, have to, you would have to simulate a Turing machine in Python? Exactly. I don't know how, but I believe I could assign as a homework problem for you to write a Turing machine simulator in Python. Input goes in a word in a Turing machine and outputs, you output if that machine accepts the word or not, right? V 
We have a language decidable or recognizable by some Turing machine. It's certainly recognizable or decidable in Python. Write a simulator for that Turing machine in Python. Done. By the church Turing thesis, though, we apply the church Turing thesis here twice. One, we don't have to do the, rever the reverse inclusion, thank God. I don't know how to convert a Python program to a Turing machine, but I can convert, convert a Turing machine to a Python program, certainly. Uh, second, I didn't actually have to give the Turing machine simulator in Python. I could just say, I probably could do it. I probably know how. Now, if you are ever challenged on this, if this is a, a, like a fine line you have to walk on what you can and can't do. If you are ever challenged on this, you have to be able to be, you have to be prepared to provide the appropriate details, okay? Uh, again, the homework question asks you to nail this down exactly. Uh, when can you apply this? But you, you should convince yourself if you, you are, you have to know the confidence of if something, you could write a program for something. Then you get to say, okay, I don't have to actually do it. There exists a Turing machine for it. I can then reason about the Turing machine, okay? So Python is uh, Turing complete. Now, the, the remainder of the lecture today is going to be some weird um, structures that happen to be uh, Turing complete. Before I get into that, uh, we talked last time about the state TM, uh, the two-way TM, K tape TM and the NTM. Why are these all Turing complete? Those are all equivalent to the Turing machine. Right. Well, yes. But the part that we need for them to say that they're, we proved that they were equivalent by, by proving that these uh, were contained in the languages recognizable by Turing machines. But the part that we need to show that they were Turing complete was actually not that part. We needed to show that the, each of these uh, classes can simulate a Turing machine. The other way it doesn't matter, right? This was the part that was important to show it's Turing complete. By showing that, and that was the easy part of the proof for all of these, right? Uh, the fact that the non-deterministic Turing machine is a generation of the Turing machine means that the non-deterministic Turing machine is Turing complete. Uh, we get the reverse inclusion for free by the church Turing thesis, but we did prove the reverse inclusion using uh, BFS, right? So we proved the, and this direction of the inclusion is quite easy for all of these. So all of these are also Turing complete for the same reason. Uh, right. Now, um, let me give you uh, two non-obvious Turing complete models of computation. So recall everything we did about grammars, right? We had a regular grammar. What did the regular grammar look like? It had rules of the form like a single non-terminal goes to a terminal non-terminal or a non-terminal or the empty string. And we... Um, in the homework, I asked you to prove that you could put a string here, right? And it would still remain a regular grammar instead of one symbol. Uh, this is what a regular grammar is. A context-free grammar is uh, what? You have a single non-terminal, but it goes to a string of terminals and non-terminals. Right? We had a context-sensitive grammar, which we kind of briefly talked about. And if you have like A, B, B, this goes to A, a V union sigma star, B, where uh, A, B are fixed strings. Right. So basically, uh, a context-free, a context-sensitive grammar is like a context-free one where you're allowed to conditionally apply. Um, rules. Now, if you notice, the form of the string is getting more and more general. Here we have very restricted forms of rules. Here we have unrestricted on the left-hand side. Here we allow some unrestriction on the, excuse me, unrestricted on the right-hand side. Here we re relax some restrictions on the right-hand side. Left-hand side, excuse me. Um, so it turns out like the, the, it appears at least, the less restricted your rules are, the more languages you can decide. So let's just consider what are called universal grammars. Q 
excuse me, not universal grammar, that's Chomsky and something. It's unrestricted. Unrestricted. So Chomsky is a theory of the universal grammar. Unrestricted grammar is a different thing. All we're going to do is make it unrestricted. So we're going to consider grammars of the form V union sigma star goes to uh, V union sigma star. Now, this is a string rewriting system, basically. All you have is a set of rules that you see any string, replace it with any string, okay? Unrestricted. There's no restrictions in the definition of an unrestricted grammar. Um, none at all. Second thing to note is because we have no restrictions on it, there is no real difference between a, a terminal and a non-terminal. So that distinction is kind of arbitrary, so we can even get rid of it. Oh, my God. So the final thing to note is each class of, uh, as we've restricted and unrestricted the rules, as we've restricted and unrestricted the rules, uh, they appear to encompass a larger and larger class of uh, languages. So what language, what kind of class would you expect that an unrestricted grammar to produce? This may surprise you, but it turns out that the unrestricted grammars, which I'll call UG, are Turing complete. The, the unrestricted grammars are so powerful, they can do anything that a Turing machine can't. So first off, uh, why is it the case that you can do this? You can, this you get for free by the church Turing thesis. Anything producible by unrestricted grammar is uh, recognizable by a Turing machine. Why? You get it for free by the church string thesis, but you can say, I could write a program to simulate an unrestricted grammar. An unrestricted grammar would be given a set of substring replacement rules. I could get it to produce the strings that I want it to, uh, and I could accept those strings if it matches the input, whatever, right? You could write an algorithm for an unrestricted grammar. Certainly that's true. Um, but it's not obvious why every recognizable language is producible by an unrestricted grammar. So this is the harder part that we need to prove today. An unrestricted grammar, it turns out, is, is as powerful as the Turing machine. It's really, really strong. Uh, the way we're going to do this is analyze very closely the computation of a Turing machine and have a grammar simulate the productions, excuse, simulate the steps of a Turing machine as its own productions. So let's take a deeper, close, a deep, a closer look at what the uh, and what a a Turing machine uh, computation looks like. So what, let's give a Turing machine for like bit flips. Right? Let's say we see an A, uh, write a B, move right. See a B, write an A, move right. See a blank, write that blank and move right. Doesn't matter. So that's a Turing machine, certainly. It computes the bit flips. Uh, and if I were to compute uh, several sequential snapshots of what this Turing machine looks like it's doing, uh, it would look like this, right? So let's say, let's say we can start at QABA. Uh, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to read the A, write a B, and move right. Read the B, write an A, and move right. Read the A, write a B, and move right. Read the blank, write the blank, and move here, I'm moving right. In the previous example, when I did this, I think I moved left. Something like this. This is a sequence of... of, of uh, state updates for the Turing machine. But it, if, you know, if you take a closer look at the configurations of a Turing machine, at each step of the Turing machine configuration, from one configuration to the next, only a small local part of the configuration changes. Right? This configuration could be very, very long. But at each step, you're only reading and writing one symbol. So if you consider the sequence of configurations of a Turing machine, it is like a string rewriting, where only a small local part changes. The part near the head. The 
See how here we replaced the Q0A with the BQ0? We left the rest of the string unchanged. Same here. Same here. Right? At each step, you're only replacing a small part of the string. So we can use that. Uh, we can re use, we can add rules to our unrestricted grammar, which simulate the transitions of the Turing machine by string rewriting in place the uh, configuration of the Turing machine. So what we're going to do is have some, uh, we want the grammar to, to produce all possible strings, but the Turing machine is going to act deterministically. So we're going to first produce all possible starting configurations non-deterministically. For each starting configuration, then it's going to non-deterministically produce the answer. So the way we're going to do this is like, um, if we had a production of the form like, uh, Let's say we were at QI, uh, we read an A, and we write a B, and we move right, and we're at QJ, right? Say we had a, a, a transition of that form, right? What we're going to do is we're going to add a rule like uh, QI A is going to go to uh, B Q J. So at any moment, we're going to hope that there's only one uh, state. There's only going to be one non-terminal in any state, and that's going to be the head. The head position is going to be the non-terminal we replace. And as we do it, uh, that's, uh, that's the way it's going to work. So first, we're going to go like um, V is going to be our set of states. It's going to be S, uh, A, uh, Q0, uh, QK. And we want S to produce first an initial configuration. And recall the initial configuration is going to look like Q0, W1, Wn. And then we maybe want some arbitrarily amounts of blanks. right? So what we're going to say is S is going to go to uh, Q0, A, uh, we'll say B. And then I guess I'll add B here. A is going to produce um, the input. So it's going to produce things over the input alphabet. So it's going to produce A, A, or B, A, or epsilon. Uh, B is going to produce blanks. So blank, B, or epsilon. Right. We want to allow as many Bs as possible. This is our starting rule, is going to initialize some word followed by enough blanks, followed by... Uh, the starting Q0, right? We had the appropriate transitions of these form for every QI. Now, we need to do the left transition, which is, and it's going to be this thing, but I want to illustrate it because it's slightly, it's slightly non-trivial here. QI, uh, let's see, we read an A, write a B, and move left. QJ. Now, here, the problem is, is that uh, because our string is, has to have some ordering on it, we need to add more than one rule uh, for the possible states that we're moving in front of. So it's going to be like, instead of having like QI A goes to uh, QJ something B, right? So we write this B, read this A, write this B, and then move left. The, pro the, the way we need to do it is we need to fill in this blank with something. So what we're going to do is put every possible symbol that we could read off the tape alphabet there. So this is going to be an A. We're going to have a B there. And so on, right? And we'll have one more for the blank. I hope that's readable. I don't think it is. Right. Just by the convention that we have, the symbol being looked at is to the left of our, of our tape head, of, of left of the current state. So we apply rules like this. This grammar is going to simulate uh, uh, our string. We need one more rule. Like if we reach the halt state, then we just remove that non-terminal.
So the, the important takeaway here is that the unrestricted grammar is extremely powerful. And in some sense, that uh, the, Turing, it is a, the universal grammar is a very different structure than the uh, Turing machine is, right? The Turing machine appears to be computation, but the unrestricted grammar is even simpler, I think, than a Turing machine. It's simply a set of string rewriting rules. That's it. You have a sequence of, uh, of rules, simple rules even, and using those, you can perform any computation. It's, an, it's, it, it's not obvious that all of computation can be characterized like string rewriting. Most string rewriting systems for this purpose are Turing complete. If you wanted uh, to show that a class or an object or a device or anything was Turing complete, you only need to simulate a Turing machine on it. A Turing machine only has three instructions, read, write, and move. Turns out it's simple. If you can simulate something like a universal grammar on it, turns out it's also a simple, right? Because we've shown uh, that the Turing machine is, uh, excuse me, the universal grammar is Turing complete, it turns out you can also use this to show other things are Turing complete. By, um, you know, transitivity, if you can show that, that you can simulate a universal grammar on some device C, then this will imply that C is uh, Turing complete. Why? If LTM is in LUG and LUG is in C, LC, then certainly LTM is in C, right? You can compose the simulations, get the same simulation out. So C, whatever, if, if you have a system that which can simulate a universal grammar, it turns out it's turning complete. Um, I want to jump to a conclusion here and say that control F, when you type control F and you do, uh, you know, find and replace, if you can give it a sequence of rules, that, copy, that operation itself can simulate any computation. It is Turing complete for that reason. You know the find and replace in every text editor? It does one thing at a time. Suppose you give it a list of rules, find and replace all these, and it would reply them in order until it found no more. That could simulate a Turing machine. You could trick it to running, into any, uh, running any program you wanted. OK. So now let me give you a different. Uh, Automata. So recall a PDA, right? We had a PDA, and uh, the PDA had a stack, right? It was, a non it was a inherently a non-deterministic object, and it had a stack. What about a PDA with two stacks? Call it a two PDA. So obviously, you can simulate a one PDA and a two PDA by ignoring the second stack. But how much more power? So th certainly, certainly it's true that the context-free languages are all decidable on a 2PDA, right? So I'm being kind of vague here about how we would give us, get, we, gave a DFA, we gave an NFA a stack, modify the transition function to do that. We give it a second stack, modify the transition function again. I'm being vague on how we would modify the transition function, but perhaps it's believable. On each operation, it can push and pop to both stacks. Maybe it pushes to pop into one at a time. Doesn't matter, it turns out. Uh, but so we think that the PDA is stronger. The two P, the PDA, the two PDA, stronger than the PDA. Why? Two stacks is greater than one. Just don't ignore the stack. But how much stronger is the two PDA? It's more complete. Why? Because you can treat the stacks as like kind of the two ends of. The perfect. Area. Perfect. It's not obvious. Here's the visual proof. So here's stack one. Uh, here's stack two. Uh, there you go. Just put them like that. So, okay, it's not obvious. I love this example because it's, it's like one stack is limited. By the way, many systems accidentally, uh, 
they're all accidentally Turing complete. We presented this course through the only automata I can think of which are not Turing complete. DFAs, NFAs, PDAs, and CFGs. It may seem like there may be more things around there because as we've spent the course focusing on, probably not. Most things are accidentally Turing complete, okay? One stack is insufficient for Turing completeness. Two stacks, turns out, is sufficient. Let's just enumerate the proof. Uh, simulate a left move. What you do is, if you just draw the stacks like this, it's obvious how the tape goes, right? If you want to move left, let's say read A, uh, write a B, and move right, what you would do is you would pop, you just designate one stack as like the good stack and the other stack as, a, as the other stack. So whatever, the tape head has to be on a cell, has to be on something. So you just say it's on the right stack for whatever reason. So let's say there's an A here, okay? What you do is you pop the A, you push the B, and then you move right. But in order to move right, you want to read this symbol, whatever the symbol is, right? So you want that to now be at the top of the stack. So what you're going to do is you're going to pop A uh, from a uh, right stack. Push B to left stack. What that's going to look like is that's going to get you here. I'll put a C here. Right? Certainly the uh, two-stack PDA can simulate a two-tape two Turing machine. The two-tape Turing machine is obviously simulatable. We just proved it. The, two, the bidirectional tape Turing machine Simulate a one-tape Turing machine, right? That part, maybe we don't even have to say. Um, OK, now the left move, again, it's going to have the same kind of complexity we had with the grammar, where you're going to have to push, pop, remember something, rearrange, and then put it back. It's slightly non-trivial. But certainly the two-stack PDA, if you just think of lining the stacks this way, you get something that's Turing complete. Um, what about three stacks? This is not an easy question. Let's think about it. Can you just ignore the third stack? So we can't ignore the other stack. Certainly, it's true that a 2 PDA is simulatable on a 3 PDA. But what else is the relationship between the 3 PDA? Language is recognizable, decidable by a 3 PDA. Language is uh, recognizable or decidable by our 2 PDA. From the church to thesis, we get that they must be equal. Yes. Here's a, let me just write it out so we can be expository. Uh, by uh, the church Turing thesis, I could write a program to simulate a 3 PDA. I'm given a 3 PDA. I'm given a string. I can just follow the transition function of the 3 PDA, and I somehow I, if the 3 PDA says yes or no, so will my Turing machine, right? So by the search, church Turing thesis, because I can write a program for this, any language which is uh, recognizable or decidable by a 3 PDA is also going to be recognizable or decidable by a uh, 2 PDA, excuse me, by a TM, by a Turing machine, right? We just proved, though, here, that we could simulate a Turing machine on a 2 PDA. Right. So anything we can simulate on a Turing machine, we can compose this to simulate it on a 2PDA. Set containment is tra transitive. So we have the fact that 3PDA is contained within 2PDA. But we've, we've also known that 2PDA is contained within 3PDA. So it turns out that 3PDA uh, is equal to 2PDA. Awesome. A third stack, two, one stack, no, no stacks, NFA. Zero PDA, NFA, limited. One stack, one PDA, context-free. Two stacks, Turing complete. Rec uh, recognizable and decidable languages. Three PDA, no more power. So zero, one, two gives you power. Three doesn't give you power. What about four stacks? Yeah. So K PDA, if K is greater than two, 
doesn't give you any power. More stacks doesn't give you any more power past two. Two is sufficiently many stacks. That's kind of crazy to think about, though. Similar to the K-tape kind of idea, like more than one tape is, is sufficient. More than two stacks turns out it's sufficient. More stacks doesn't give you anything, turns out. Um, so four PDA, five PDA, those are all equivalent, turns out, to two PDA. It's, it's good enough. Um, So these are the two examples we've done today. We gave universal grammars, and we gave an example of the two PDA. Uh, these are both very different objects, but they happen to be Turing complete. And the reason they're Turing complete is they both share kind of the similar idea of computation. They're able to perform the simulation of the Turing machine, which is a very rigorous and detailed way we can do it, but they also intuitively have what we, what we would uh, ascribe to computation. So what is in really the purest sense, what is a computation? Um, first, you have some kind of large environment. There's something there for you to work on. Maybe it's a working string. Maybe it's a some stacks. Or, you know, maybe it's the tape. You have a large thing you can work on. Uh, a few simple uh, rules make uh, local modifications to the environment. Oh my god. Um, that's it. So to emphasize, uh, the, the transition function of a Turing machine reads and writes a single cell at one point. It, and if you think of the cell as a global state, it has some input, some very large input maybe. The Turing machine can only read and write to one cell at a time. But through a sequence of these actions, it's able to perform intuitively what we understand as a computation. It's also important that even though there is a large global, maybe dynamic system, the object is only performing a very small change, a very small perturbance to a very large thing. And only through a sequence of these changes does a computation come out and occur. Um, it turns out that this broad, broader view is pretty universal to lots of science. And lots of things are, that are, sound like science are actually the study of computation. Most systems sound like this, okay? You have a large environment, and you study the rules which make small changes, okay? Think about biology or cell reproduction, okay? That somehow uh, you have some mass of, I don't know, chemical or whatever, and somehow the, the mitochondria or whatever, they make tiny changes molecularly through whatever. Or think about maybe a flock of birds, and then you know, maybe one bird has a heart attack. And then all the birds around it start having heart attacks. I don't know, something like this. Or imagine, think about economics. You have a small perturbance, a small change, and that can affect the global system uh, dynamically. A lot of those also, there's something to be said about multiple players, multiple interactions. And the Turing machine only has one tape head, but an, a multi-headed Turing machine is equivalent. Uh, it's also Turing, uh, Turing complete for the same reasons we've said before. So computation is a very universal and apparent uh, idea. When you remove the idea of the word tape and cell, and transition function, you get a very, you get a process that appears naturally anywhere. And especially in physics, you know, if you think about physics, if you think about, maybe you think about particle collisions or something, you know, you have some very small, you have a large global environment, a global state, and you make very small changes to it, and that turns out a sequence of those changes is suddenly a computation, and then you, now you're studying computing. You're studying computer science. Uh, many games, turns out, are also Turing complete. Uh, for the same reason, because they can simulate the simple rules of required for Turing completeness. So we mentioned Factorio earlier. Uh, I'll make it a, a, a more detailed comment about why these. So Factorio, uh, I don't know a single thing about Factorio except that it's complicated. It's probably Turing complete without even knowing anything about the rules. Minecraft Redstone. Uh, turns out Minecraft Redstone is Turing complete. People obviously build circuits and, and things in that. We'll, and we'll talk about that in, in, in just a second. Um, you know, people, you can see them build a computer or whatever. They built Minecraft in Minecraft. Um, 
what else? Uh, it turns out Magic the Gathering is turned complete. It's not obvious what the state is or what the change is, but it turns out that the structure of the rules of Magic the Gathering allow you to simulate a Turing machine in the rules uh, as you apply cards or whatever to Magic Gathering. I'm not a nerd, I don't know what that is. Um, one more I was thinking is Conway's Game of Life. Have you guys heard of Conway's Game of Life? Maybe you've heard of it. Conway died very recently. He was like the first guy, I think, to die in the COVID pandemic, which is, you know, really sad. That's when I think, at least I thought, well, maybe this is serious. You know, it's not, uh, it's good. He has this, he has a, the Conway's Game of Life, and I, the best way to learn it is to look it up on YouTube. But you can see, uh, you basically have an infinite grid, and each square, square is either on or off, and it, during, and each square turns on or off according to a set of rules from this, uh, its adjacent squares. And it's meant to mimic kind of biology, right? If, if a square is dead and all the adjacent squares are dead, then that square remains dead. If the square is alive, it can turn itself off. It can kill itself through overpopulation, right? So it, things grow and they shrink and they grow and they shrink. Um, turns out you can simulate a universal Turing machine in Conway's Game of Life in a very non-trivial manner, but it's possible. And it turns out, turns out for this reason, Conway's Game of Life is also Turing complete. The idea that Minecraft and Redstone Minecraft Redstone and Factorio are Turing complete rely not on simulating a universal Turing machine. They rely on circuits. So circuits. Are circuits Turing complete? Yes. Why? Because you just said that they... So, so let me... Let, let, we got to be... Let's, let's be formal here. Okay, <laughs> Factorio and... People say on the internet, and then maybe they say incorrectly, but they say that Factorio and Redstone are Turing complete. Okay. But they say they're Turing complete because they're able to simulate circuits in them, okay? In fact, Tears of the Kingdom is also Turing complete. I saw, I saw a guy put a one-bit adder on... <laughs> apparently, you can do it that. Um, but why are circuits Turing complete? Why is that sufficient? Yes? You can use circuits to simulate any computer. Why? How? This is a, this is a hard so question. you can make an AND gate, an OR gate. Okay. Um, a NOT gate. A NOT gate? Yes. Um, a universal circuit basis. But how do you use a universal circuit basis through a composition? You create a Boolean circuit. How does that simulate a Turing machine? So if you have a, you know the conjecture normal form? Okay. So if you have like a certain amount of, um, say you have like A or B or C or D, you can s simulate that on three variables. Um, I read exactly this problem in, in the algorithms book and they talked about basically you can use the three cnf to simulate any computer program so anything you can do ah, with the okay so sat is np complete and you can prove sat is np complete by converting a computation history of a polynomial size well let's not get into it the takeaway one, uh, the, que the question I was alluding to, though, is that in a Turing machine can use arbitrarily large tape, but each circuit is always finite in size. So there is a little bit of mechanics that have to happen here. And what the reason, the way we get around this is we allow the circuits to be what's called a non-uniform model of compu uh, computation. So what this means is, uh, a Turing machine accepts inputs of any size, right? So a Turing machine takes an input of any size. Uh, an, it is what we call a uniform model of computation. You circuits are too interesting to just throw them away because they're not big enough for larger and larger Turing machines. What we do instead is we allow an infinite family of circuits. And we say if each circuit, uh, if we want to run an input of a fixed size, we choose that circuit, right? Right, so like consider addition, okay? A 32-bit adder will correctly and safely add all numbers less than 32 bits. It won't add a 40-bit number. Right, but that's okay. You can just make a bigger adder, right? So that's what we do. We just say that each, for each input length, there is a circuit to compute that input length, and we allow an infinite family. So it's a non-uniform model of computation. 
Um, there's one more remark I want to make on um, uh, Turing completeness. And it's really the, what is the biggest difference between a PDA and a Turing machine? It, you might think some memory structure about the stack or whatever. But there, there is a, one inherent limitation of a stack-based computer that it turns out you get sufficiently if you just allow a tape. And it turns out it's this idea of universal simulation. Uh, there, a universal simulator is a, is a device which can simulate other devices of its own kind. So uh, there exists a universal uh, Turing machine, a U, which on input, U takes on input two things. It takes on input a description of a, perhaps a different Turing machine, M, and it takes on input a word, and it returns... Uh, M on uh, W. Basically, uh, maybe I should write it this way. So a Turing machine is a object, but objects can be represented by strings. Just take the code of a Turing machine, pass it as an input to a different Turing machine. The universal Turing machine takes as input, the, takes as input a machine and a word and simulates through the transition function of, this turn, of its input, the word on W, and it outputs it. This is what's called a universal Turing machine. Why does a universal Turing machine exist? By the Church Turing thesis, I could, I could probably write a program that given a Turing machine and a word as input, I just run the Turing machine on the word. Okay? So I could probably, there, then there has to be a Turing machine which can simulate other Turing machines. If this machine loops on this word, so would this machine, right? Because it's simulating it. Um, there does not exist a universal PDA. There does not exist a universal DFA. The universality here is what makes uh, the Turing machine so important. The fact that it's able to simulate itself is what is really the heart of the church Turing thesis, what gives it all its power. This is very unique, and, it, it, and any device that can simulate a Turing machine is why we, why we say uh, it's Turing complete. Okay, I think that's it.